Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Karen Brown, and I am the Chapter Ambassador for Aging 2.0 Denver. I am also the CEO of iAging, Innovations for Aging. You are joining us for the webinar, Medicare Advantage Plans Combat Senior Loneliness. Before we actually get into that, that deep topic of loneliness and social isolation, I wanna talk a little bit about Aging 2.0. I know that there are probably some of you on the call who are not familiar with who we are. We're actually based in San Francisco, that's where our headquarters is, and our mission is really accelerating innovation to address the biggest challenges and opportunities in aging. We have a very broad community. It is international, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational. There are more than 80 chapters across the globe in 20 countries. And of those 80 chapters, there are approximately 60% that are in North America. The other 40% are in countries across the globe. Um, this was just announced as our last chapter call last Thursday, and we're really just seeing some massive increase in the chapter growth, a lot of interest in innovation and aging. We have more than 3,000 different startups across the globe, and those have really come about as a result of our pitch events, so each chapter has generally done a pitch event in the first six years. And uh, then those actually go to the, to the HQ. And we've managed to gather that information so that we have a better sense of who's doing what, where. We have more than 30,000 global subscribers uh, to our newsletters, both at the chapter level and um, from the headquarters. Now, the chapter itself really is charged with creating this local ecosystem of innovation. So we educate connect and broaden awareness through events. Um, each chapter does at least four events a year. And I think last year, the Denver chapter did probably eight. Uh, we, we actually, beyond those eight, we were involved in Denver Startup Week, title sponsors, and the kinds of events we hold are really showcasing entrepreneurs and their products, connecting them with senior living, public policy related issues, um, payer issues, even things like talking about ageism and really having that in-depth conversation. We do have an event coming up this May 3rd in Colorado Springs. Uh, it will be in the afternoon. If you don't want to join in person, you can actually join by live streaming. Uh, and the topic is telehealth. In a state like Colorado, where 70% of the state is rural, access to healthcare is critical. So this whole topic will really talk about how can we improve access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. To learn more about that event, go to www.aging2.com slash Denver. Um, you can actually sign up for the event there, get a few more details. You can also sign up for our newsletter. The one thing that I, I don't have on this slide, which is a brand new initiative of Aging 2, it's called the Caregiving Collective. It's really been designed as a membership organization that will really match up those entrepreneurs or entities who are coming up with solutions in the aging space specific to caregiving with the senior care providers or the companies like Procter & Gamble or Sampo, who is a Fortune 2000 insurance company in Japan, um, and really pull them together. So there'll be in-person meetings, virtual meetings, as well as an app with artificial intelligence that will really help bring the, the bodies together and better match you. Um, I think with that, that's kind of an overview. Please feel free to connect with me if you have questions about the chapter. I'd like to move on now to introduce uh, David Norris, who is the CEO and chairman of Element 3 Health. And he's gonna talk to us today about loneliness and social isolation. David? Thank you so much, Karen. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, first, I wanted to go through a few logistics for today's webinar. Uh, if you have questions, we would ask that you email those questions in to an email alias that's questions at element3health.com. So throughout the webinar, if you can email your questions in, we'll spend the first half of the webinar going through the presentations and then we'll spend the second half going through the Q&A. So please send your questions in. We very much look forward to making this a, an interactive session. Uh, the, also, the webinar is being recorded and it will be sent out to everybody that registered for the event. You'll get a link to the recorded webinar so that for those that aren't able to participate or if you can't uh, stay for the whole webinar, you'll be able to hear the rest of it. So my name is David Norris. I'm the chairman and CEO of Element3 Health. 
And our goal today is to talk about social isolation and loneliness and how it's currently being viewed by the industry, what the Medicare Advantage plans are doing to address it, and some interesting solutions in this area. Right off the bat, I want to make a distinction. Uh, social isolation is different than loneliness. Uh, there are people that can be socially isolated and not be lonely. So we make a distinction uh, on, on those two different subjects. As we go through here, we'll, we'll talk about both of them um, and we'll, we'll try to differentiate between solutions that address social isolation versus loneliness. To start off, there, there are really three, three areas that, that we typically talk about, physical activity, mental activity, and social activity, that all have a significant impact on the health of seniors. Today, we're gonna to focus on the social activity side and the, the areas of social isolation and loneliness. The market that we're talking about is huge, and I wanna highlight the fact that today, there are over 100 million people that are over 50 in the United States and over 10,000 people turn 65 every day, again, just in the United States. So we have a, an enormous set of people that are, that are getting older, and the challenges of socialization and loneliness continue to expand as this group of people grows. Uh, the, the steady increase of, of people getting older is complicated by the fact that many people are beginning to, to live alone. The social changes that have occurred in the United States have really made seniors more independent. And of course, as they get older, that independence can be uh, both a good and a bad thing uh, with the, the isolation becoming a problem, uh, especially as people increase uh, in the population, but also as the various life changes occur, people can often become isolated um, pretty quickly. And some of the interesting stats that you may or may not know, the three in five households consist of a single person by age 80, which is, is pretty amazing. And the estimates by 2035 are that 14 million people will be living alone that are seniors. So this, this is a huge, huge change in our society. The problem of reduced activity uh, in, encompasses a number of, of pieces, but overall, in the United States, it's about a $75 billion problem. And this make, is made up of, of a reduction in physical, social, and mental activity. But there's a relationship between the three. Uh, so often, as somebody becomes more socially isolated, their physical activity will be reduced. And the, the correlation between things like reduced physical activity obviously have a huge impact on their mental uh, acuity and mental health. Uh, and so the, the relationship between these three are very important. A $75 billion problem really is just in the United States. And today we won't talk a lot about the international side of it, but I will just mention that certainly in the UK and in, in Asia, specifically in Japan, there are huge numbers of seniors and the problem is, is just as bad, if not worse than the United States. So this is definitely a global issue. When you look at social isolation, there's a lot of people that are doing you know, significant research around how impact, how social isolation impacts seniors. A few of the interesting stats, uh, one of them that uh, Julianne Holt came up with was that loneliness, uh, and, and specifically in this case, uh, social isolation and loneliness uh, is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And I thought that was an interesting stat. It kind of brings it to a level of uh, reality and, and makes it easy for people to understand that, that it's a significant health issue. You can also see some of the other stats and there's a long list. These are just a few. Uh, people that are socially isolated are two to five times more likely to die prematurely than those with strong social connections. So this is a real problem. It has a direct correlation to our seniors' health. And it's a, a problem that the industry is beginning to recognize significantly. One of the challenges that we face in trying to address this is that seniors, in, in many cases, are more reluctant to connect with people they don't know. So where a you know, younger population may be more open 
to adventuring out and, and meeting people that they don't otherwise know, seniors tend to be more reluctant and they often lack the tools to be able to find uh, people that they can relate to that have similar passions or similar interests. Um, they're also often unsure how to connect outside of their immediate geography, so their, their immediate neighborhood, they, they don't often venture out. So all of this leads to a challenge, and, and it generally leads to them being more socially isolated. The, one of the negatives of social isolation is that it often leads to a lack of a sense of purpose, and, and that can obviously have significant health consequences. So seniors are, are kind of a unique group that are being affected by social isolation, and it's getting worse. Some of the historical efforts that Medicare Advantage plans have offered have come up a bit short. One area that, that they've certainly focused a lot on is physical activity and trying to get seniors to be more healthy by going and, and exercising or going to the gym. And, and while that does have a positive impact and it's a, it's a very worthwhile thing to get people to physically exercise, there has been a, a void in the area of social connectivity uh, most seniors that, that go to the gym uh, go and they'll work out and then they'll leave and the level of, of social interaction is just not significant enough to help solve the problem of social isolation and loneliness. So this problem has been around for a while. The attempts to use physical activity to solve it is, is certainly uh, good, but not enough. So let's talk a little bit about how some of the leading organizations are, are combating social isolation and loneliness. Um, Medicare Advantage plans specifically have recognized that this is a really significant issue and there have been a, a lot of discussions and, and a lot of different uh, presentations at different industry events around social determinants of health and, and specifically social isolation and loneliness and how it is causing significant problems that translate into uh, costs for the payers. Uh, obviously, in the end, the healthcare issues, uh, they're ending up having to deal with those. Uh, there are more and more studies that are measuring the actual cost associated with social isolation and loneliness. And I'll, I'll just give a shout out to Charlotte Yee at, at AARP. She's done some very interesting studies around loneliness and, and specifically calculating the actual cost uh, of social of loneliness for members that, that have reached that certain point. And so if you are interested in getting some specific data, Charlotte's uh, done a lot of interesting work in this area. The impact that social isolation is having on the quality of life and the sense of purpose is beginning to, to come to the forefront as one of the biggest issues. So in addition to, to obviously having an overall health impact, the quality of life uh, is, is recognized as one of the most important things that you can do for a member. Having somebody that's existing but is not having a good quality of life or doesn't have a real sense of purpose can, can be pretty miserable. And we see that with a lot of seniors where they're, they're just not able to enjoy the latter part of their lives. One of the things Medicare Advantage plans are doing, and this is a, an interesting survey that we really highlighted how far along are Medicare Advantage plans in both understanding the problem, but also in trying to decide how they want to address the problem. So in the survey, over 50% of payers had identified and were either deploying solutions or preparing to de deploy solutions for social isolation and loneliness. Another 25% were concerned about the issue and trying to decide how to address it. So they had already identified that it was a big problem and were really looking to put in place a solution, but they hadn't yet picked a solution. Uh, another 10% were studying the problem, uh, so they really hadn't yet determined whether it was a problem that they wanted to address. And then there were a, a number of other payers that were um, either not aware of the problem at a significant level or hadn't yet decided what to do about it. So the, the really interesting point here is that, that Medicare Advantage plans have gone sort of over the top of the hill in terms of understanding the problem and making a decision that they need to address it 
And th this is significant, obviously, this is a step towards solving the problem. There are also a number of industry organizations, not including the payers, but or organizations that are focused on solving this problem. And AARP is certainly one to, to highlight. They have a number of initiatives underway to both understand the problem and to try to begin to address the problem. Uh, the AMA, as an example, have recognized this as an issue. And we'll talk a little later about some things that they're doing to help make this problem uh, both uh, understood and as well as addressed. And then uh, other organizations, obviously Aging 2.0, and of course our organization, Element 3 Health. I thought there's a couple of interesting references, and, and there's a lot of information out on the net. If you do a search for seniors and social isolation and loneliness, you'll find an immense amount of, of information. And, and this is good. This is helping people understand the problem. Here's a few kind of interesting pieces that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the problem is, is significant, and this is recognition that the problem is now being understood. So uh, AARP did a, a really interesting study where they found that one in three adults are lonely, um, and that's obviously a huge percentage. Um, the University of California at San Francisco has also done some very interesting work in this area, and I, I won't read through all of these, but I think the point is that the Medicare Advantage plans, as well as the industry in general, is really understanding the problem and beginning to dive deeper into some of the specifics. And here's an example. Uh, there's an industry effort underway led by United Healthcare and uh, the AMA to create new ICD-10 codes that specifically allow physicians to capture the social determinants of health, including social isolation and loneliness. And on the right, you'll see a little snapshot. This is just one piece of the overall proposed set of what's called Z codes that in this case, you can see some of these directly relate to social isolation and loneliness. And, and I think this is one step towards helping uh, the overall health system to capture and then be able to address this issue. In the past, this area, social isolation and loneliness, has been lumped into other codes that, that really weren't appropriate because there were no codes specifically for physicians to diagnose this problem and, and actually capture it. And this is an important step because this is one step towards making the treatment for social isolation and loneliness uh, reimbursable. So if you can't diagnose it with a, an accurate code, it's difficult to get paid for trying to, to solve that problem. So this is one step. This effort is underway now. And in fact, they're asking for comments, I believe by the beginning of May, for their proposed codes. And if you just do a search for United Healthcare um, and the social isolation and loneliness and Z code, you'll, you'll find their information about it. It's very, very interesting effort and we applaud it. A couple other things that are important. As the Medicare Advantage plans understand this problem, one of the things that they're beginning to do is include in their Medicare Advantage or the Medicare bids uh, solutions for social, social isolation and loneliness. And the bids for 2020 are coming up, they're due in June, and there is a scramble with a lot of Medicare Advantage plans trying to get their bids in where they put in and include a piece to address social isolation and loneliness. So this is one more step towards formalizing and, and understanding how the industry is both understanding the problem, but in this case, really proposing specific solutions that Medicare can then reimburse for. Uh, so the deadline for the 2020 bids is June 3rd. And I threw in this chart. This is a, an interesting chart that just lays out the timeline for Medicare Advantage plans to submit information to Medicare. And uh, for those plans that are already doing this, we applaud the effort. For those that have not yet included a, a solution for social isolation and loneliness, uh, obviously, we uh, definitely encourage uh, Medicare Advantage plans to at least explore what they can do to bring to their members a solution for this problem. In some cases, those solutions can not only be cost reduction measures, much much like um, m many of the diabetes prevention programs and others where they're trying to address the cost issues around a particular area, but more and more health 
plans are trying to bring to the market solutions that give them a competitive advantage and, and don't just focus on cost savings, but also focus on differentiating and adding features that members like. So I think this this timeline obviously is pretty tight for this year, but there's still uh, time for Medicare Advantage plans to put in a proposed solution for social isolation and loneliness. So I wanna talk a little bit, we've got a, a bunch of questions that had come in around what are some of the solutions that are trying to address this problem in the industry? And uh, there's a lot of different things that are going on. Uh, we're certainly in this area. So one of the things I wanna do is talk about what Element 3 Health does to try to address this problem. We have created a very unique solution that uses activity clubs to engage seniors around their passions and the unique thing here is that historically, uh, many of the plans have tried to change the behavior of members to get them to do something that might not be their first choice. It might be something that they don't really wanna do, like go to the gym or, or exercise. Uh, in our case, we've taken a, the opposite approach, which is to take the passions that people have around activities that they like to do and encourage them to do those activities, but to do them with other people that have the same passion. So as an example, a, a club might be a cooking club or a cycling club or a pickleball club. And if somebody loves cycling and they are able to do it with other people that have the same passion, it ends up creating social relationships that are pretty deep and are pretty lasting. So we've taken an approach that social isolation and loneliness is a problem that can be addressed without asking members to do something they don't want to do, which typically is not very sticky and, and people won't stick with it, but rather to ask them to do something that they love. One of the things that in this example, like ballroom dancing is a perfect example. If somebody really likes ballroom dancing, what we attempt to do is fan the flames and help them to do what they love to do, but to do it more and to do it with other people so that they begin to build those relationships that become the, the net, sort of the social net that supports them. And we identified in many cases, multiple passions that people have. They may start with ballroom dancing and find out that they also love or want to join the reading club because they love reading books with other people. And so this concept of taking people's passions and using that as the fuel to drive activity around other people and by doing so address social isolation and loneliness but without directly telling them to internally we say like we don't want to tell them to eat their vegetables but rather we just fan the flames of an existing passion it's it's quite a unique solution and and has in in numbers has resulted in much higher adoption rates and stickiness. So people stick with it because it's a passion that they already liked. We have a network of these activity clubs all across the United States, you know, thousands of them. And we have over 120 different passion areas. So if you like gardening or if you like cooking and so on, we, we have a, a very broad set of clubs across all of these different passions. So our goal is really to match the passion that a particular member has with clubs that, that have a group of people that have that same passion. What we've found, and I'll throw out some statistics in a minute, um, these clubs end up becoming a very meaningful part of the member's life. Uh, they, in effect, become an extension of their family. And we've seen this over and over and over across different types of clubs that these are not just casual activities that people go and, and do occasionally, but rather uh, they have a lot of time typically on their hands. They end up doing these activities with other people and really focusing their time and energy around the people that are in these clubs. It, th the activity is important, but the people are really what makes it happen. And in some of the statistics that we've surveyed our members around, what, you know, what is the reason that you wanted to join a club? 86% said that they formed relationships and friendships by joining a club, and that's what was important to them. Uh, it's certainly true, 95% uh, of the members that joined a club 
did the activity more than they did before they joined the club. So 95% were being more engaged and more active, which is also important because obviously being active is important. But the relationships that they're forming as part of doing those activities is really the key. One of the things that, that we've done to help facilitate that activity is we've built a platform that these clubs can use for free. It's called GroupWorks. And it basically helps them run their clubs. It provides content that spurs on engagement. It allows them to schedule events and really get their members more active. But this is an engagement platform that we give to clubs as a free tool to help them get their members more active and to make being in the club a more, more enjoyable experience. We've got a few questions that came in, and I just want to highlight that as part of our activity platform, we've created a unique way to evaluate and to report on the activity that seniors are actually doing. And we do this across three dimensions, physical, mental, and social. So when somebody's participating in a club and doing their thing, if it's cooking or walking or reading, whatever it is, we have an ability to score how active they're being and to translate that into what we call an activity benefit. And this gives payers an easy way to understand about the activity levels of seniors and to begin to correlate that with health benefits and, and costs. So this activity benefit is a is kind of a unique thing that we've done. It's it's really valuable. It gives you a very quick and easy way to understand how active somebody's being. So that's the the overall presentation. We've got a huge number of questions coming in, so I want to give us a chance to to go through some of those questions, and we're going to do it very interactively. And as we do, please you know feel free to to email your additional questions in. Um, we'll we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, one of the first questions that came in that I'll take, and then Karen, I'll flip it over to you for the next one. So the question was, you know, are Medicare advantages, are Medicare Advantage plans taking social isolation and loneliness seriously? And and the answer to that is, um, I think yes for a portion of them. We we talk a lot with uh, plans, and we're we're involved with a, a lot of different kinds of plans, whether they're regional or national plans. And I would say that. The most um, innovative plans and the ones that are really looking downstream at where they can differentiate themselves and really address the costs that are really burdening them and, and really causing them to be less profitable. That is certainly a big area, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of plans that are innovative attacking these kind of issues because they know they're long term. Uh, there are a set of plans that are not yet to that point, um, and, and based on this couple of slides back where we showed the numbers, more than half are already have identified the problem and are trying to put in place a solution. So I'd say there's there's quite a few, there's quite a bit of activity in this area. It's not done yet, but but it's moving. Karen? Uh, yeah, um, David, I've got a, a couple of questions here too. And David, could you just repeat the email address for people to send questions into for those who oh. might not have caught it um, on the get-go? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's uh, questions at element3health.com. Right. And, and definitely e email those in and we'll, again, we've got a list of them right now. We'll just be going through them. Right. right. So one of the questions really kind of talks a little bit about the GroupWorks platform itself and whether or not there are any costs associated with that. Um, from my understanding of working with Element 3 Health, for, for a senior or a, a a club to join, there isn't any cost. Um, David, can you offer just a little bit more since that is, in fact, one of your products? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, the, the platform is really free, and, and the intent of GroupWorks is to make it available to these clubs so that they can run better, so that they can make it a more enjoyable experience for their members, and there's no cost at all for them, uh, and there's no cost for the members that are in the actual clubs. Uh, they can participate. When we work with a payer to take their members and to match them up and deploy them into these clubs, we actually pay for the membership dues of those members. So it's a really nice benefit if you think of it from a, from a member point of view. If I'm in a cycling club and one of the payers that I'm, I'm already signed up with is now going to pay my cycling club dues, 
that's a, a great thing. And many of the seniors are on fixed income, so this is actually quite a, an important thing for them. So it's it's not only free for the clubs, but it's actually a benefit for the members. Right, right. So I'll take the next one. There, there's a, a question regarding sort of the, the timing on Medicare Advantage plans getting in a, a, a social isolation and loneliness solution. So the question was, you know, what is the time frame that they have to submit a solution? So um, we in the deck we had a timeline that kind of specifies the, the various steps. There's a lot of steps, but June 3rd is the drop dead date to have the Medicare Advantage plan submissions in. And so prior to that, you'd have to include the set of supplemental benefits that you wanted to include as part of a plan. And many, many of the plans are working on this right now, kind of feverishly trying to get it ready for June 3rd. And, uh, and this, again, is an area that we're hearing a lot about. They're, they're definitely focused on including social isolation and loneliness in those bids. Um, David, I want to add to that. I mean, this is sort of a personal experience, but I, I actually had my annual physical and went to New, New West Physicians. And actually, this was the first time that I got a questionnaire that actually walked through like 10 questions specific to social determinants of health and asking, you know, whether or not, you know, I felt lonely or isolated in any way, did I need to engage more? Um, so I really think there's a, there's a focus even at the doctor level to really start looking at the social determinants, recognizing that it has a significant impact on, on health of older people. Um, more comments, yes, David? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think it, it's amazing. I was just at a, a couple of healthcare conferences, the Health Evolution Summit in Laguna Beach uh, a week ago, and it, it was about a third of the conference. This was a conference with a lot of CEOs of health plans and, and big uh, financial players that are in healthcare, and there was a significant emphasis on social determinants of health, which encompasses a broad set of topics. But social isolation and loneliness is certainly one that was very, very prominent. And Charlotte Yee from AARP had a breakout session with about 20 people specifically focusing on this topic and how it was going to be addressed. And, and I think, you know, the, the general uh, sort of feedback that I can report from that event, which was a great event, was that there's a deep understanding of the problem and, and literally broken down now into dollars and cents about how much of the impact it, it's costing health plans. And now people are definitely shifting their focus to, okay, we, we know it's a big bad problem, let's go fix it. And so almost all of the discussion was around how do we fix it? And that that's good. Um, I think there's still a lot of uh, question about the best way to fix it and, and the kind of solutions that should be deployed. But it, the fact that we're having those kind of dialogues and it's such an important topic at these very large industry events really highlights the significance of the issue. Right. Uh, David, I have a, a question here. Someone's asking a little bit more about, you know, is this specifically for the older population or is there an intergenerational component? Um, you know, I think that that whole perspective that you know, it's great to engage people. It's great to engage uh, and connect the ages. Um, it's my understanding that you certainly are not a 55 plus club, but that there are opportunities for anybody interested, for example, cricket, which I had no idea you actually originally had a club that has that, but, but there are clubs that, on cricket across the US. You don't confine that to any specific population. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, our, our clubs, um, we typically have clubs all over, you know, it kind of follows the population. So there's thousands of them all over the United States and it's all different types of clubs. Certainly cricket's one of them. And we have uh, clubs that are interesting for seniors. So we typically have clubs that would be of interest to the audience of, of 50 and older. Uh, certainly Medicare Advantage plans focusing on the 65 and older group uh, are, are, are a primary focus for us, but we do have a lot of 50 plus members that, that go into these and many of the pairs are interested in catching members right before they become Medicare Advantage. So in their case, they would love to have healthy 65 plus members. So they love the idea of getting people right before they pick an MA plan to, to get into these clubs and get active. Um, so it it's more and more what we're seeing is that the MA plans 
love the idea that they can offer a benefit that is perceived to be very valuable and interesting and exciting to members because that causes them to pick their health plan. And then on the flip side, that it then translates into cost savings. So it's sort of two sides of a coin. One is make it attractive and make it differentiating because the MA plans are all competing to differentiate themselves uh, from the member's point of view. And on the other side, if it helps to, to lower their cost, then that's an amazing additional benefit. Right. One of the questions that we got in was, um, how do you address the barriers to activity groups, things like transportation and so on? And I think this is a really a great question because the social determinants that that really cause social isolation and loneliness can be many. Uh, many times there's a life transition that occurs. A spouse dies or somebody retires out of a work environment where they had a lot of friends and then they don't, or they move to a new place. And, and all of those can begin the downward spiral of social isolation that leads to loneliness. Um, things like transportation can be a big issue. And what we've done as a company, we've partnered with a whole set of uh, external service providers that can provide supplemental services that help a member that wants to participate in a club to actually be able to. And those could involve things like transportation where we partner with all kinds of organizations, including like the YMCA, that can provide transportation. On the other side, there's some members that may be less mobile where remotely participating in a club is a, the only way they can do it. So we, we enable that. So it, I think it's, we're trying to provide as many mechanisms as possible to eliminate the barriers that would otherwise prevent a member from participating in a club. And we are knocking off as many of those as possible. Transportation, certainly one. Uh, mobile, be, mobilities, uh, another, and being able to remotely participate. There are some really interesting uh, activities going on, again, that I'll highlight. Uh, AARP has done a very interesting study where they're using bots, so text bots, to communicate with seniors. So they have a, basically a machine that's talking to the senior through texting, and they're able to help identify seniors that have a high probability of being socially isolated. And that's a way that we can at least begin to know who we need to target to help in advance of them becoming lonely. And so there's a, a set of activities that can even predict uh, social isolation and loneliness, which is pretty, pretty impressive. David, I want to pick up on that one as well. Um, when I was in New Orleans last week at the Boomer Summit, I also had a chance to speak with Charlotte Yee from AARP. And we had a, a pretty good conversation talking about their age-friendly communities. And she actually, I mean, one of the, the eight factors or topics that they really address is, is loneliness, social isolation, purpose, and engagement. I mean, they kind of roll it all together. And they really they think that, you know, this kind of thing is really beneficial. Um, and we're exploring opportunities to connect with the AARP age-friendly communities across the U.S. to further promote, uh, you know, connection and engagement, again, for, from all three factors. Um, I, I did, I think this is an interesting question because you just touched on it a little bit. Um, there was a question asking, are you envisioning a virtual component to some of your clubs? And, and I'm going to offer a little bit. I, I participated in a group called Age Without Borders, and we've actually convened people across the globe. We were able to set up special little meeting rooms. I mean, are there any opportunities? And not every club is going to be conducive to that kind of a forum. But do you think that's something that could long term for those people who might be more challenged at getting out, be able to connect in some way, shape or form? Yes, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, we have thousands and thousands of clubs, and I'd say it's probably 5% or maybe 10% that are virtual. So we have some national clubs where people all across the United States are in online clubs. And, you know, they, they are certainly good and they are effective. Uh, our preference in general is to, where possible, m take seniors and, and sort of move them into these physical clubs where people are getting together physically. And, and a lot of the clubs will get together once a month for a meeting, but then they'll have various activities. Like if it's a cycling club, they'll ride once a week, or if it's a sewing club, they'll have a little group that gets together and sews once a week. And then monthly, they'll have their monthly get together as a club. 
So I think the physical aspects of those clubs is really important. Some people can't because of mobility reasons or geographically, if they're in a rural area, there just might not be a club they can physically participate in. And so for those, the, the virtual communities are great and they are a, a really good way to do it. Um, but our, our preference and, and general direction is to get as many of them as possible into physical clubs uh, just because of that uh, sort of the, the tactile side of being in a physical club is hard to replace. Sure. Let's uh, see, we have another question. Um, I think this is this is about international. So the question is, what is this problem like outside of the United States? And I'd say from our perspective, you know, there are all kinds of studies and, and activities going on, certainly in Europe and in Asia, looking at the long-term problem because it is getting worse. Uh, for those of you that don't know, in, in the UK, as an example, they have one of the first kind of really unique titles, the Minister of Loneliness has been put in place and they are so serious about you know, this significant problem and how on the, on the longer term as a country, the UK can try to address it. So they're, they're certainly very aware of it. In Japan, the problem is even worse the number of seniors that are uh, sort of added every day and, and the problems of being isolated in Japan have become you know, a real hot topic and, are, and a big issue. So it's, I'd say it's a very much a global problem and everybody's looking at how to address it. And there's a lot of discussion back and forth and studies and so on. Um, I think in the US, because of the social structure that we have, where seniors are much more independent than most other countries, we have it worse than everybody else. Um, it, it literally is a bigger problem here than anywhere. And you know, we're, we're all struggling with how to fix that given that seniors are independent and they go live by themselves. And as they get older, that tends to, to be a problem. So it's, it's not a unique problem to the United States. I think it's just a bad problem for the United States. Do well, you wanna add anything to that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. you know, I can, it's a huge problem in some countries, you know, I, I serve on the governor's task force, the strategic action planning group on aging, and we were doing a little work and, and happened to run across China. Um, actually, families, older people are becoming isolated from even their own children. There was a point in China, I think it was two years ago, where they were going to pass a law that if a child, an adult child did not connect with and communicate and help care for their older family member, they could be jailed. Um, so I think that sends a clear message of just how catastrophic it, it can be. I, I haven't followed that legislation to know if it was implemented, but I think it sends a clear message of, you know, the challenges of, of maintaining your own life, your own family, and, and ensuring that your older adults are, are cared for. Um, yeah, I, I have, to, yeah, totally agree. I, <laughs> there, there are a couple of questions here. I'm, I'm going to offer my perspective, but you are a little bit more of an expert on this. Um, there's a question about the creation of the ICD codes and sort of like that time frame for adoption or the process. Um, and the second piece of that is is sort of really looking at, and man, you've talked a little bit about this, but um, it's my experience that Medicare and Medicaid, they're asking, well, are these things that Medicare and Medicaid will eventually you know, well, they adopt them too as soon as uh, Medicare Advantage does. It's my experience or, or you know, limited understanding that, that Medicare Advantage tends to be a little bit more innovative and willing to move forward and tackle some of these tougher issues. And once it's, it's proven a little bit more effective and, and shows some return on investment, both for the individual and the healthcare system, that they can actually move into the Medicare or Medicaid program. Um, is there, can you address that, that particular one about MA and then into Medicare, Medicaid, and then also the ICD-10 codes? Yeah, yeah, so let me take a, a couple of those. So on the ICD-10 codes that are coming out, you know, the, the idea is to make it very easy for physicians to diagnose that there's a problem or there might be a problem and to then prescribe a solution. And, and, and this happens every day you know, when you have doctors prescribing drugs, but social isolation and loneliness is just as significant of an issue. So in the past, there's been no way for a physician to document that they see a problem. So with these ICD-10 codes, they will now be able to do that. And that's, that's absolutely critical for us to be able to understand the magnitude of the problem and then be able to address it. 
the ICD-10 activity is really being led by United Healthcare and, and the AMA. They have their proposal out for comment now, and again, you can go out and read it. You can look at the codes. You can submit your feedback for those, and they're going to submit them in about a month, and those should be uh, processed fairly quickly, and we would expect them to be usable next year. So that's a an industry effort that's underway. It's just a beginning. There's there's more to do. Those are those are a simple set of codes, but it's a, a very important step in the right direction. Um, for Medicaid, you know, there, there's there's a lot of discussion right now with CMS around Medicare and getting the social social isolation and loneliness issue identified and reimbursable, which for the MA plans is really important. Obviously, they they want to know that if they put in place a solution for this, that they can get reimbursed from Medicaid, and and that is in process. I'd say it's it's probably at step let's say three or four out of ten. So it's not done, but it's in process. Medicaid is is several steps behind that in terms of the ability to translate social isolation and loneliness to, as an example, low income families. So I'd say we're not quite there yet. Even even with Medicare, we're still at the beginning or kind of almost in the middle of the process. So I think Medicare is going to take a little bit longer to, to get Medicaid to that step. Okay, great. Yeah, I, 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 I would... I had another question, but just another one that came in, and we have about five minutes left, so we're just going to run through some of these questions quickly just to make sure we get. Uh, one of the questions was um, the bid process, and if you miss the deadline in June 3rd, uh, what do you, you know, is there another opportunity? And I think this is a really good question. So for, for Medicare Advantage plans, they have to have their bids in by June 3rd, and pretty much that's it for the 2020 Medicare Advantage plans. But there are a couple of things that are, are really interesting that CMS has introduced. So if you miss that deadline, there's a new program called VBID, and the VBID program is going to allow Medicare Advantage plans to play with and test and try different supplemental benefits that were not part of their bid. So for those plans that, that and for whatever reason, can't get a social isolation and loneliness uh, piece into their bid for June 3rd, there is this other program, and I believe uh, that the VBID program will, it's in process now, there's about 15 Medicare Advantage plans that are in it, and there are more that are that are wanting to get in it and can apply. I believe it kicks off towards the end of this year, and it will, again, enable Medicare Advantage plans to try out and test new offerings that were not part of their bid. So that's, I'll kind of say your backup plan if you don't make the June 3rd deadline. Great. Um, you know, I, I have a, a, a Oh, Karen, I think you got muted. I think I think we oh, lost Karen. Oh, yep, oh, I'm there, back. There you are. I'm so sorry. Okay. I was going to say that there was a comment about um, older people and and engaging them in in sort of like this the activity platform versus maybe the silver sneakers. And I really do think that I can speak from my own personal experiences. Um, you know, if my mom were she aged, she, she passed away at about 93, but she definitely wanted to stay engaged. That opportunity to connect with people and to socialize um, was really important. And, and the ability to actually have something that would be a tickler to her, you know, something that would notify her of upcoming events and activities that she could actually attend, that was that would be really helpful. Because I, I know when my father passed away, it actually seemed to become she became a little bit introverted and it was harder for her to reach out. I mean, she went to a couple things where they weren't really clubs per se, just an event. And she, when she didn't connect with people, she was less likely to go back. So I, I think having this club network um, and having the ability to be with people around a passion really is a, is a key element that makes this a little bit different than some of the past efforts uh, to engage physically at least. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting point. I, I love Silver Sneakers and, and you know, Tivity Health, who, who owns Silver Sneakers, I think it's a, is a great company. And I think they've taken a really good step towards trying to get seniors active physically. Uh, but like you say, you know, sometimes people don't want to do that. They don't want to go to the gym. They'd rather go play tennis. 
And so the clubs are, are really complementary to what Silver Sneakers offers. If, you know, for the, let's say the five to 10% of a population that want to go to the gym and take advantage of a Silver Sneakers type program, that's great. And, and for the others that might not want to go to the gym, you know, maybe they want to join a painting club and, and, and be together with other people and do painting. I think it's really a compliment. So I see us as being additive to the, to the benefit that, that plans can bring to their members uh, rather than being sort of an alternative to Silver Sneakers, which, you know, we don't do gyms, we do clubs. So mm -hmm. I, I very much see us as an additive. And, and for those people that don't want to go to the gym, join a club and, and go painting or go uh, hiking or running or walking, whatever, whatever your passion is. And again, the, the, the difference in, in getting somebody to do something they are already passionate about it's just much easier because they they will do it because they love it already rather than than the inverse so and i know we're we're coming up on the end of our our time here we've, we've got one or two more questions we can take so karen you you want to do the next one uh let's see here so i i actually do have a question here from um from a couple of people asking about, is there a place that they can actually go to look at the GroupWorks platform, kind of explore the clubs? Um, and I know that, you know, iAging actually has a, a, a well, we, we're on the GroupWorks platform. So I certainly have seen it and, and been involved and connected on all those parts. Um, are there, I guess, should people just email in if they want that opportunity, David? Yeah, well, I'm gonna flip to this last slide um, before we, Go through all the rest of the questions. We, we actually put our contact information in here, which people don't always do. And I always find it annoying when you have these kind of discussions and then there's no way to follow up. So Karen's contact information is there, mine is there. So feel free to send us notes and, and we can obviously have follow-up discussions after this and, and you know, feel free to email us, don't be shy. So, so regarding group works, um, we've actually built a network. We have uh, you know, a lot of members in our network, and we have built it as a closed network specifically to protect the privacy and security of the seniors. So you can't just come in like with Facebook, you could just go in and just join. In our system, everybody's a qualified person that comes into our network, whether we're getting them from a pair or whether a club has qualified the members to be real legitimate members. And, and that's to protect the seniors. So if you want to try out or, or get exposed to the GroupWorks platform and, and take a look, we are absolutely love to do that, but we do it in a controlled fashion and, and it, it protects our members, which is extremely important. This, unfortunately, seniors uh, are, are a targeted group. They get, um, they get targeted by people that want to scam them and take their money. And so uh, platforms like Facebook have, generally gotten pretty negative pushback from seniors because of all the problems with privacy and so that's why we take that step so for, feel free to, to email me if you want a, a demo if you want to have a, a discussion around it we're happy to do that and i think i think one one last question karen did you have one or i've got one if you've got one go ahead <laughs> okay so i'm just gonna pick one here so the one of the questions that i'm getting is um, how socially active do these clubs actually get? And, and I think I'm going to interpret that a little bit. I, I, I think what that means is, uh, you know, do, do people that join these clubs really get socially connected and active? And I, I think it's a good question. Um, like most things, if you participate in one of these clubs, uh, by default, you're going to be around other people and you're going to, have activities that engage a whole group of people. Whether or not you form long-term relationships is obviously up to you. Uh, I think the thing that we've seen and, and the numbers uh, that, that we've seen show that members that have a passion for a particular area that get into a club with a bunch of other people that have the same passion, um, that they generally form three to five deep relationships and 10 to 20 lighter weight relationships out of these clubs that typically have 100 or 200 members. So where where there's not a passion, like if I was gonna to go to just a lunch club and have lunch with a bunch of people, the, the relationships do form, but they're less uh, substantial uh, because there's not a passion that's driving the relationship. So this idea of these 
passions. And it, it, we use the analogy often of, of going to a party and you don't know anybody. And as soon as you can find somebody that, that loves what you love, let's say it's bowling, and you start talking about bowling, immediately the ice melts and you have a, a, a friend and you, you start having that dialogue. So that to, do, to the degree that you can find ways to connect people based on these passions, you can establish the deeper and longer term relationships more quickly and they'll last. Uh, where you don't have those passions, where it's more of just like a social get together, you'll have relationships that form, but they won't be as deep and they won't last as long. And with that said, I think we're at the end of our time. I, I think this is a fascinating topic and we're really, really dedicated to, to making a difference in the industry and solving this problem. Karen, thank you so much for setting this up and for inviting us to participate. And I'll, I'll let you wrap up. Great. Uh, well, and we're delighted to have you. Again, social isolation and, and loneliness, those topics, purpose and engagement, they are big in the newspapers right now. They're big in the headlines. Um, so we will be sending out a follow-up within the next 48 hours that will provide a link to the webinar with all the slides. Um, we will also ask a couple of questions. We will ask you why you joined the webinar, what you were hoping to gain from it or understand, um, as well as some um, additional information that you might have found helpful so that it helps us to provide better information for, for people wanting to learn more about social isolation and loneliness in the future. Um, I do want to remind you that May 3rd, Aging 2.0, is having our telehealth forum in Colorado Springs. Um, please go to www.aging2.com slash Denver to sign up for that and up for our newsletter. And, and with that, David, unless you have anything else, I, I guess we can call it a webinar. <laughs> That's great. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And again, don't be shy. Feel free to send us follow-up questions or, or connect with us after the event. Very nice to, to meet everybody by, by phone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.